So, I'm here to talk to you about space law. Um, and you might think, well, this is a strange topic. Um, you know, why is there law in space? So, if I were to ask you what your life would be like if we didn't utilize space, um, you may or may not be able to answer, but just think about the sorts of things that we use space for. Uh, and there's just a plethora of things. I mean, space is an incredibly important arena for commerce, for military affairs, for strategic affairs and geopolitics, for environmental purposes, for disaster management, for financial transactions, for the internet, for imagery, for a whole range of reasons, for communications. Without space, indeed a day without space, and there have been various seminars which postulate the day without space. Well, um, I attended one of those in the United States, albeit it was largely a military related thing, and the military very penal space, I'll come back to that in my remarks. But speaker after speaker said a day without space would be a disaster. We are so attuned to the technology in so many ways and really, it's only when you stop to think about it that you realise how important space is to everything that we do, and indeed to the functioning of humankind. And I know that sounds a bit overdramatic and Bruce Willis-like, but if you think, you know, it's true now if various GPS satellites, as one example, if a number of GPS satellites were somehow rendered um, unworkable, then the implications of that for a whole range of activities would be catastrophic. Uh, it's guesstimated, for example, that in the United States, which perhaps is the most vulnerable in terms of its space assets, because it is still the major space power, although there are some other important powers as well. But um, if an, a handful of GPS satellites were disabled, the, the United States relies on, then its whole infrastructure would collapse, literally, from sewage systems to traffic management to a whole range of issues, let alone all of the other strategic uses that are being used in space. So space is incredibly important and becomes increasingly so. And of course, as technology develops, as it often does, then space becomes even more important because, frankly, we are now able to use space in ways that are far beyond the contemplation of anyone a handful of years ago. And that development of technology is just ratcheting up further. And, you know, it's on that theme of technology that I'll spend a bit of time. So I'm one of those still rare breed of people who is involved in space law. I don't want to call myself a space lawyer because, in fact, I have a number of passions. Um, and I've had the privilege, for example, of working at the International Criminal Court with the judges for the last 10 or 12 years. And um, I do a whole lot of other things. But, you know, space is fun. And uh, I've only been an academic for 12 years, um, having had some previous careers, which is where I came across Patrick. And um, so I figured at the grand old age of whatever it was when I became a, an academic I, that I should at least pick up an area that there aren't many others because, hey, if you want to make a mark at that old age, you know, it's a lot easier to do that when there aren't many. And, but but um, there's an incredible now enthusiasm amongst the students for learning about this and a recognition that areas of the regulation of outer space, the regulation of cyberspace, the interaction between the two, the parallels between the two, and the differences. You know, they are intim intimately associated with a whole range of, of other areas. I've given lots and lots and lots of talks um, about space to engineers, to scientists, to health professionals, to diplomats, to politicians, um, you know, and the list goes on and on. So it's not, even though 
I come as a lawyer and I talk about the regulation, it's an area that I think is relevant to a whole range of disciplines. And it's certainly an area that is relevant to the notion of international affairs. Because as I said, space is an incredibly strategic area, an incredibly political area. And you know, there's great rivalry. There's cooperation between the <coughs> many powers, but there's great rivalry as well. And you know, it's some of those themes that um, I want to explore. So space is crucial for all of us. It's crucial for the world economy. It's crucial for strategic thinking, geopolitics, human rights, commercial enterprise, technological activities, and future, and, and frankly, as I said, the future of humankind. And so law has an important part to play in that. And for the reasons, maybe if you get a feel from the brief remarks I've already made, you'll see that law is important, and it's important given the implications of utilising this space, it's important to have some rules of the road. And those rules of the road are very generalised, fundamental principles, and they struggle. They struggle to meet the specifics of some of the activities because, as is typical in any area where technology races ahead, the law struggles to keep up. And, you know, anything to do with space, but think of um, you know, cloning and issues like that, bioethics. Think of anything where technology moves forward. Law really struggles. So these fundamental principles, some of which I'll just very briefly um, describe to you, are really important because even though they're not directed towards the specific, they still cover those areas, like humanitarian law. You know, the rules that came out of, firstly, the battlefield and then the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols. You know, those rules have been super, no, not superseded, but, but following those rules, we've had the development of weapons technology far beyond the <laughs> contemplation of the drafters of the Geneva Convention. And yet still, those fundamental principles in the Geneva Conventions apply to that new technology as well. Same sort of idea. That said, you can only take fundamental general principles so far. And you know, my argument, although a lot of people disagree with me, in the area of humanitarian law, and likewise in the area of space law, is, OK, now is the time to continue to apply those fundamental principles, but recognize that we need some more specific rules to cover these activities that are developing. For the purpose of the space as well, we also want to avoid the sociological phenomenon that some of you might be aware of, known as the tragedy of the commons. Some of you may have, may have heard of that idea. The idea that you can Sorry, have the, tragedy of what? the commons. Sorry, I have a lisp, and my lisp is always you know, multiplied uh, in a microphone, so uh, people often think, what is he saying? What is he saying? And the tragedy of the commons, for those of you who perhaps haven't heard of it, is a, is a sociological phenomenon that was described uh, firstly in the 60s and 70s, and it's been brought back in various ways. And that relates to the legal categorization of outer space. So let's do some Space Law 101, although I don't want this to be, this is not a, a lecture on space law, but we need to try to work out what it is we're talking about. So I, um, I was destined to have an interest in space law because I am a Sputnik baby. I was born in 1957. So in 1957, in October, the, the Soviet Union launched the first human-made object to orbit the Earth. Now, by 1957, we had clearly established, even from 1919, but clearly established legal rules about airspace. You're all aware of that, okay? You know that for all intents and purposes, there are some slight wrinkles on this, but for all intents and purposes, airspace is like territory. So it's subject to the jurisdiction of the underlying state, okay? There's, you know, some freedoms of innocent passage and things like that, but we'll ignore that. But airspace is like territory. The airspace above Australia, Australian law applies. Easy peasy. All of a sudden, 
Sputnik is launched in 1957, and it then circles the Earth. And it circles the Earth, I don't know, 1,300 times. And clearly, in doing so, it overflies a whole range of countries. And guess what happens? Nobody says, get off my land. Nobody says you're trespassing. Nobody says you need permission. People are aghast, you know, it's initially in awe, but also aghast. If you read the New York Times on October 5th, 1957, you know, there's one line about, wow, what a technological marvel, and then the rest of the page is all about, my God, what, you know, we've got to double and triple and quadruple our own efforts, because if they can do this, what else can they do? Because remember, this is really important, this is the height of the Cold War. And indeed, as you're all too aware, only a few years after I was born, we almost got to the unthinkable point. So we really are in the height of tensions. So getting back to the legal categorization, what is space? It's not part of the underlying territory. No, excuse me, it's not part of the territory of the underlying state. Because almost instantly, through the practice of states, nobody said, my laws apply, you need my permission. So almost immediately, from a legal viewpoint, we categorised space in a different way, an area beyond territorial jurisdiction. And that gets, and, and so let's think of it as a commons. But that's only half the issue. So then, and, and, and the closest parallel to space from a legal perspective that might be a bit easier for you to grasp is the high seas, okay? which is also under the law of the sea, as you're all aware, an area beyond territorial jurisdiction. Now, this is where the tragedy of the commons comes into it. All right, so you have an area that is beyond the realm of national law. You have two choices. I mean, clearly you've got lots of choices, but to make things easy, you have two choices then as to what you do with that. You can either say, this is what we might term a res nullius, an, an area of no law, of nothing. Now, applying that to the high seas, let's assume for a minute that we had categorised the high seas as a res nullius no law applies. National law doesn't apply, but no law applies. There's no management system. What would states do? They would come there and they would dump all of their nuclear waste. <laughs> I'm being filmed, so I won't say things like crap, but I've just said it, right? <laughs> They'll dump all of their nuclear waste and crap, and you would get the tragedy of the commons. That is an area which everybody has access to, but it's not managed. And so, Everybody believes that, you know, that they can do it, but through this unmanaged incremental use of a common area, the area is destroyed. And the original uh, drafters of the tragedy of the commons did their example by sheep, you know, sheep grazing in the commons in the UK. You know, if you go to London, there's Wandsworth Common and Clapham Common and Battersea Common. Although I'm told now Battersea, the suburb is now to be pronounced Batersia. <laughs> you know, and when you change the, the pronunciation, the property prices go up a uh, whole range. Okay. So, <laughs> law is important because of all of these uses of space, but it's also important to avoid the tragedy of the commons. So instead of a res nullius, an area where there's no law, we categorise the high seas and we categorise outer space and maybe one or two other things. People talk about Antarctica, but from a legal viewpoint, Antarctica is different. And the Arctic, I mean, boy, I've got to come back and talk to you on another occasion about the Arctic. That's a whole new ball game, yeah? So we're not sure what we're going to do there. But instead of a race nullius, we talk about it as a race communis. An area, by and large, that we all have a stake in. None of us own it individually. None of our individual laws can apply but collectively, it belongs to us. Therefore, we can institute management regimes through regulation. Thus, in the law of the sea, you've got UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, really, really detailed provisions about the high, management of the high seas. Thus, we have some treaties as well. 
Okay, so why is it important to understand that? Because it's important to work out then how do we manage space. We recognise that we need to manage space, but we recognise that because of its legal categorisation, it's not as straightforward and people have got to get together and work it out. And because it affects, as I said, so many aspects of our life, it's important to get it right. Uh, to give you another example of, you know, which is rather tragic for me, um, this morning I'm a bit of a tragic Arsenal supporter in the English Premier League, and it's only through satellites that I can watch my <coughs> beloved team get absolutely humbled. Who, who did you lose to? Oh, some... Dynamo Zagreb in Croatia. Not a good look. Okay, but it, if that already clouds your idea about my judgement, I'll, <laughs> I'll cement it more by saying that, and there is another one in the room, I'm also a St Kilda supporter. <laughs> so, so you probably think anything that I've got to say has got no credibility anymore. So, we need to try to work out how we manage <coughs> these rules, this, the rules of the road, because ever since Sputnik, given the geopolitical situation at the time, technology really moved forward quickly. The technology was driven by military concerns. Wars, and wars either hot or cold, if I may use that ridiculous uh, dichotomy, wars are great for technology, as you know. And in this really, really tense time around when I was born, as I said, Sputnik spurred the United States, which then, of course, spurred the Soviet Union to develop all sorts of technology. And remember, even though things have changed a little bit, satellite technology is not a million miles away from missile technology. And so, so there's a military bent to all this. All of the technologies, by and large, it's changing a bit now, but really most of the technologies, at least, upon which you rely for your daily lives in space, were all driven by military concerns and then spun out into other uses. So communication satellites, GPS satellites, remote sensing, you know, imagery satellites, a whole range of things, all driven by military concerns. So it's really important to work out what the rules are. The technology is developing. There are two protagonists who really are staring down at each other. But they are the only two players in town at this time. So as much as they have ideological differences, and they really did, of course, as you know, they were by and large both smart enough to realise that they were the only two players in town. And so for them, it was important, obviously, to have some fundamental understanding of ground rules, but also for those ground rules not to be too rigorous and too specific or in other words, to represent vague language. We sometimes call, talk about the language of the lowest common denominator when you talk about negotiated treaties because everything is a compromise. And so, well, I didn't bring them tonight, but out of those discussions, a whole range of treaties came into being through the auspices of the United Nations. It's no coincidence that you know, virtually straight after Sputnik, the United Nations General Assembly started passing resolutions saying, wow, this is fantastic. Of course, space is only going to be used for peaceful purposes. And that expression, peaceful purposes, is really a mantra of space. And indeed, a committee was formed, which first only met in the early 1960s, although it was formed in the late 50s, which is the mainstream of the United Nations in terms of the development of legal rules. And that committee is called the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's really important <coughs> to COPOS, um, which sits in Vienna, uh, and uh, Australia's been a foundation member of that. Although, on another occasion, we can talk about how Australia has really lost its way in space, although hopefully it's beginning to find its way. So, we have a, a series of treaties, there are five, Four of them were 
relatively well taken up at least by all of those, the major space powers, and as other countries develop technology and develop some form of space capability, essentially they subscribe to those four treaties. The last of those treaties, known in short term, in short form as the Moon Agreement, was not taken up. That was a treaty that deals with the possibility, and this is, you know, negotiated in the 70s and early 80s, the possibility of exploiting natural resources on the moon and other celestial bodies, mining asteroids and things like that. Already then, those discussions, you might recall in during the discussions which were going on at the same time by the same countries and the same people about the United Nations Convention on the Royal Sea, which was agreed in 1982, around the same time, there was a lot of excitement about mining the deep seabed for its natural resources. So, this bring, begins to bring up ideological differences amongst states, because particularly in the case of space, but also when it came to mining the deep seabed, which was the proposal of some of the industrialized countries as they were negotiating UNCLOS, clearly you have very few haves, by that I mean having the ability to do so, and a whole range of have-nots. This in the context, of course, of the rapid decolonization that's going on, so that, starting with Mr Mugabe, my dear friend, um, so that all of these countries that had been essentially raped and pillaged as colonies for all this time, with obviously some exceptions, but had been exploited, all of a sudden become independent, and they become fiercely independent. And they have a voice, they have a vote in international meetings and also in the General Assembly. And because they have this historical memory of being exploited, all of a sudden, when international law has to delve into new sorts of areas, so not territory, but common areas, where the potential exists, to exploit, and exploit for <coughs> material gain, whatever that might be, financial and otherwise, then ideological differences appear. It's like I have this apple pie sitting here in front of me, and it belongs to all of us. And yet, only three of you can get here. There's a barrier. And so I say, well, this is a great piece of apple pie. I think I'll have a bite. And all of you are saying, well, hang on a minute. You know, this is my apple pie as much as your apple pie. And so benefits have somehow to be transferred to us. So those ideological arguments began to emerge. And there were attempts to try to reconcile that by designating natural resources, both in the deep seabed and in space, as what we call the common heritage of mankind. Pardon the sexist language, but that was the language of the time. So you, some of you will remember that there was some idea that somehow if we give it a really sexy name, description, then all of the ideological differences will somehow disappear. So this notion of common heritage of mankind, and we've moved on from that. We talk about, for example, the environment now as the common concern of humankind and various things. You know, making the point that there are common issues but still not really getting to the grip to grips with the haves and the have-nots, and how you somehow slice up this apple pie in a way that satisfies everybody. So that's a long way of saying the last of these treaties, the Moon Agreement, was rejected by the industrialised countries, just like UNCLOS in 1982 was rejected by industrialised countries. With UNCLOS, as you know, just when it was about to come into force in 1994, they reached a compromise. We haven't done that in space. Why? Because, well, for a whole range of reasons. But the fallout from these ideological differences, and they're, you know, they're really strong. Whether they're real or in the perception, there's probably a, a, you know, a mixture of both, but they're really strong. And the fallout from that was it's been impossible to have any other United Nations treaties since the attempts in the early 80s for the Moon Agreement. That's a long time ago. 
technology has raced forward. There have been some General Assembly resolutions dealing with some specific uses. Even there, the ideological differences arose when it came to things like television broadcasting, which in those early days, it's as ridiculous as it sounds now, the industrial, excuse me, the developing countries, the nomenclature used in these treaties is developed and developing. I know we've moved on from that, but if I may use that to make things easy. The developing countries feared this new technology of direct broadcasting by satellite. Because all of a sudden some person, not next door, but at the other side of the world could somehow infiltrate us with propaganda and a whole range of things. Okay? I mean, clearly things have moved on. But ideological differences emerged there and with remote sensing, with a whole range of issues. So we had some General Assembly resolutions. And then since then, as space becomes even more complex, and more states come on board. By that I mean have capability, although there are only you know, a handful that have really significant capability, but there are now, whereas there were once two, there are now maybe 60 or 70 states that have some form of space capability. But the, the differences between them are, uh, are great, but the, there's a greater common interest in at least trying to work out some guidelines. Impossible to have treaties for a whole range of reasons, and I'll come back to that when it comes to military stuff. But we've had, over time, some more guidelines, non-binding voluntary guidelines in the areas of, for example, environmental law, space debris. Again, I'll come back to that. So lots of people who are much smarter than I talk about this notion of soft law. You've always heard about it. And it's an expression that I hate, soft law. You know, as a bit of a dinosaur, I think, well, you know, something's either law or it's not law. It's, mm -hmm. In my mind, it's like saying someone is sort of half pregnant or something like that. <laughs> but soft law instruments, as much as I derive the term, are incredibly important in international affairs. And there are soft law instruments that have fantastic influence. One only needs to think of, uh, for example, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the most translated document in the world. That's a soft law instrument. Indeed, as soon as that resolution was passed in 1948, everybody was clapping and screaming and patting themselves on the back how they saved the world. And then intervention after intervention by states in the United Nations said, this is great, aren't we fantastic? Of course, this is not binding. So soft law has its issues, but there's a lot of soft law that is involved in the rules of the road for space. And then increasingly, we have national law. Now, it's not trying to apply your law to space, because as I said, that's not possible. Although you can you apply your law to the to the uh, to the satellite. Okay, that's a different issue. But but it's about regulating the entrepreneurs, regulating private industry. Because even though the rules of the road that were set up under these treaties essentially contemplated that space would be the domain only of states, clearly that has changed. Space has, is as much now, and I think becoming more so, as much now a private enterprise, an entrepreneurial, but not just entrepreneurial, but large corporates investing gazillions of dollars in space with, of course, the desire to themselves make lots of money. So national law is important because clearly the treaties don't bind the private entities. The states are on the hook given their obligations under the treaties, including there's a liability regime. I won't go into all the details, but states are on the hook. So national law is important for them to carry through the obligations they have to authorise and supervise space activities, for example, to lay off the financial risk that they might have if a commercial satellite causes damage to another satellite. Whole range of issues. And so more and more countries have national law. Australia was the, I think, sixth or seventh country in the world to have national space law. We have uh, legislation called the Space Activities Act 1998 with some regulations, which were promulgated in a totally different regime in that was promulgated 
with the expectation that we might become a major launch service provider. And Christmas Islands, that you know, Christmas Island has had so many incantations, hasn't it? It was a casino, wasn't it? And obviously a detention centre and other things. And at one stage, the plan was to make it a launch site. And Australia, you know, got so far as that Australia and Russia uh, in... Wasn't that Woomera? No, not at Woomera. No. We have Woomera, but yeah. Woomera is designated only for defence purposes, so not for civil purposes. And that's an issue, but it, that's what the current, current Woomera regulations are for. But so interesting, what you mentioned. Were they going to do at Christmas Islands? They were going to have a commercial launch service provider. So people could come and launch their satellites from using Russian rockets launched from Christmas Island. It never happened. But the legislation was passed, the 1998 Space Activities Act with that as the main focus, although it has, does some other things. And uh, off the record, you know, that legislation, as good as it is for the purposes, for, for the play, main players in space in Australia now, um, has, you know, there, there's a need to look at it quite carefully to meet the needs of this increasing technology. And, you know, I think the government's in a position to do that soon. I can't talk about that any more than, I, than that, but hopefully that's something will become public soon about maybe looking at that. So, we have law. We have lots of law. Let me very briefly, and this is not a law lesson, and then I'll talk about what I'm supposed to be talking about, but I think, hopefully, this is not boring, and I think the context is helpful for you. But some of the fundamental principles, particularly in the first of the treaties that we had, which was uh, in 1967, so a full 10 years after Sputnik. I'm already going to primary school. Of course, these fundamental principles were negotiated over a series of years, with there being some important General Assembly resolutions, once the Soviet Union and the Americans could be brought into the same room to start discussing these things. Because clearly, none of these principles would have been agreed, none of these treaties would have come into being without the approval of the United States and the Soviet Union. So some of these fundamental principles, I won't bore you with all the details, but <coughs> the non-appropriation principle <coughs> reinforces the idea that space is a commons. Now that's been you know, challenged in various ways. This is interesting. It says that space activities shall be carried out in accordance with international law, including the Charter of the United Nations. Now, I'll come back to that because some young, budding, if I may say, naive lawyers look at that and go, wow, that's fantastic, right? We don't, there is no lacunae. All we need to do is just get rules that we have on Earth and just say they apply in space. And, you know, I think that's a wrong approach, but I'll come back to that. Um, there are some restrictions on some uses of some weapons, but by no means is that a comprehensive. Um, space is to be used for peaceful purposes. That's the most debated term in <coughs> space law. What does it mean? And there's a whole range of divergencies of use. Historically, we sort of have reached an agreement now. And there's a whole bunch of other things. It's all about everybody should cooperate with each other. We all love each other. We'll fully inform the, through the United Nations exactly what we're doing. We'll share technology. We'll share ideas. And I, I'm not meaning to sound too cynical because there is a lot of sharing in the scientific arena, even between so-called, you know, superpowers that are opponent, opposing each other in other ways. There's a lots, lots of scientific sharing, but there's a lot of non-cooperation and a lot of rivalry in a whole range of ways because of the importance of space. But also, and I know I'm being videoed here, so this will look stupid, also because space is a bit of this, chest beating. You know, it's a bit like, you know, I want you to have a perception about my capabilities, whether or not the perception matches my actual capability is not necessarily the point. So there's a lot of sec secrecy and a lot of, uh, a whole range of issues. And remember, as I said, the technology is still regarded in the military circles and in government as missile technology, even though it's changing. So, for example, many countries, the United States is a really good example, have very strict restrictions on the transfer of their technology. I'll come back to that. So, challenges. 
the, the growth of the technology means that space, as Kate said in her, in her very kind introduction, space is very quickly becoming accessible to many more people. So just to name two types of technology, small satellite technology, incredible. And I'll come back to that. And human, the idea of human aerospace, Peter said to me that she wants to go to space. Right. You know what, Peter, I don't know where you are, but Peter, you will go to space. You will have that opportunity. It won't be in five or ten years' time, probably, despite what Richard Branson says. I know Branson's in Australia at the moment. Uh, I've met him and had lots of discussions with him. It's not going to happen that quickly on a commercial basis, you know, unless you're, you have $30 million and you belong to a band called Unthink or something like that. Wasn't there some guy from a band who spent $30 million and went to the space station, okay? I, assuming no one in the room is prepared to spend that amount of money. But at some point, the technology will get to a point where the public perception of safety and risk will allow that to evolve into some form of commercial industry. I still say it's a long way off, but hey, I go to lots and lots of talks where the technology is incredible, if you believe everything that people say. All right, all of that is good, but we're not very good at selling the idea of space. So recently, I was in Montreal, uh, not last week, but in March, and it was so cold. Montreal is a freezing place. And I picked up a copy of the Wall Street Journal, and on the front page, to my initial delight, there was an article about space law front page Wall Street Journal, wow. I then actually read the headline and was, if you like, <laughs> quickly brought down to earth, what a ridiculously bad pun that is, I'm sorry. <laughs> By this headline, if a Martian wrecks, what is it? Your rocket ship who was liable. <laughs> that was the headline, front page Wall Street Journal <laughs> on 20th of March. And I just thought, is that really what people think about space law? Given everything that space does for humankind and the importance of having rules that guide that, is this the best that can be done about the laws that make this possible? It's extraordinary to me, of course, you know, I'm a converted, right? But it's extraordinary to me that one of the great challenges we have in space law and the rule the way ahead for space law is getting people to actually take it seriously. The lady in the said here, you know, until she came here, she thought, well, you know, I didn't know there was law in space. Hopefully now you have a bit of a feel about why it's important. But so many people out there, if you did a poll amongst, maybe not your family, but a group of people and said, hey, I just heard this funny guy from Sydney talk about space law, what do you think that's about? You know, lots of people will say, well, little green men or whatever, yeah. And, and it's really hard to get decision makers to take this seriously. Those of us, and I've done this a lot with lots of governments, who talk to governments about the need to establish rational, practical, appropriate legal frameworks, are often met with cynicism, counter arguments stemming from inertia, conservatism, financial concerns, obviously it's an expensive business, and unfortunately a lack of understanding. In Australia in 2013, the then government, I can't tell you which Prime Minister because we've had so many, right? <laughs> the, the then government in 2013, I know it was a Labor government, issued our long-awaited <coughs> domestic space policy. Now, I've written lots about it, apart from the many vagaries and problems and flaws in the policy itself, one thing was striking. The word space was not included in the title at all. It's called the Australian Satellite Utilisation Policy. I know it went into cabinet with the word space in it. It came out without the word space. The ministers at the time wouldn't even countenance the use of the dreaded S word because for them it conjured up a sense of, I don't know, unreality or even comedy, a bit like our friend at the Wall Street Journal. So. Selling space is a real challenge. Not to anyone in the room, hopefully, but getting 
people in, who are in position to make decisions really understand how important decisions are. So, we've got to work on that. Because we are at the dawn of a new era in space activities, and that will require some serious thinking about exactly how to adapt and adopt appropriate legal frameworks that can strike a balance, and I'll talk about these balances. There are very competing interests, for example, between commercial enterprises and start-up entrepreneurs and governments, and there's lots of others. Very, very, very different agendas. Governments are typically conservative. There are lots of risks associated with allowing space activities, but clearly, if it can be done properly, lots of potential benefits, and you've got to find that balance. We need to build on the frameworks, and to do so, we need to, in a sense, take a holistic approach. I mean, this is, you know, blah, 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 generalizations, but we're not very good at that. We need to get the engineers and the lawyers and the regulators and the health scientists and the you know, entrepreneurs and commercial entities and the regulators all in the same room. And we don't do that. Because typically, in building up regularly regulatory frameworks, there is this, that's a cliche I know, but it's in this silo mentality at the national level, but also at the international level. So you have a whole range, for example, of United Nations agencies that deal with different things. Clearly there's overlap, but they never talk to each other. They never talk to each other. And that also happens in space. So it's a real challenge to try to change the thinking in terms of quote unquote law making. To develop proper enabling law, not just law for the sake of law, but law that understands the needs of those who want to participate, but clearly still always has to balance, as governments should and regulators should, risk. So put yourself in the shoes of, for example, the Federal Aviation Authority in the United States. It has, if you, if you talk about the Richard Branson type activities, this idea of suborbital to tourism and point-to-point -point flying, as I said, I, you know, it's, it's still some way off but the entrepreneurs are spruiking this. And the technology has been developed. Now, whether we meet the standards, and of course you also have to have tragedies along the way. But put yourself in the shoes of the FAA. US government says, okay, this is your baby. The FAA, Federal Aviation Authority, fantastic organization. I know them really well. But they, they're good at what they do, which is aviation. All of a sudden now, you're talking about, sure, something that involves airspace, something that might involve, involve travel, either up and down or point to point, but incredibly different types of technology, which is still evolving, which we still don't understand. So put yourself in the shoes of the regulator. It's your job to come up with rules, to come up with standards. How do you do that? How do you do that if you don't understand the technology? And imagine if you do it, okay, you say, right, to the best of my ability, these are the rules. You must comply with these rules. And then let's say an operator complies with the rules, something goes up, it explodes, blows up. Clearly, the hindsight shows that the rules were inadequate or inappropriate. You know? Do you want to be the regulator who's passed the rules that that, that haven't worked. You know, it's a really difficult exercise to try to be proactive in regulation. And some would say, I'm not saying this, but some would say you almost need to have the disaster to then be able to sit back and regulate. And that's, in often times, how international law works generally in the area, I've mentioned humanitarian law a few times. Humanitarian law is always reactive. My other field of international criminal law, we're always <laughs> reactive. You know, you try to prescribe crimes in a way that you think is appropriate, all of a sudden you're met with some atrocity that just doesn't fit within the crime, and yet should. Now, so you've always got to then amend and adapt definitions subsequently. So you're always reacting. You know, 
Maybe that's the fate of law, but it's very difficult when you've got technology moving so quickly. So, that's a challenge. So, let me give you some other challenges, and I propose to do this through a series of questions. Because I think before we can come up with some ideas about frameworks and, and quote-unquote solutions, we need to understand what issues might be. And because the position is so fast moving and fluid, we, we just need to try to work out where do we want to go? What, are we, what is appropriate to regulate? And indeed, is law an appropriate mechanism, certainly not the only one, to regulate some of these difficult issues? The thing that is clear is the existing principles, as good as they are, are not sufficient. Just like I argue, although the International Committee of the Red Cross think I'm a heretic, that I, you know, I argue that the existing humanitarian law rules, fantastic, you know, we've obviously got to apply them. But you know, as the technology of warfare, including using space, but think of cyber technology and robotics and semi-automated weapons and heaven forbid, automated weapons. Um, you know, I argue that those fundamental principles need to be augmented by more stuff. But you know, these are discussions for another day. So we need to understand the questions. Only by understanding the questions would you then be able to understand the answers. And you can't just say, well, the answer is easy. Okay, there's a problem about, let's say, the environment of space. Remember the provision I mentioned before about the Outer Space Treaty, international law applies in space. Well, let's just take some environmental principles that were developed terrestrially and just say, right, bang, we're going to apply those principles to space. That is a band-aid solution and it won't work. You know, we really need to sit down and try to work it out. Okay, so in a sense, the, the I suppose, the most high profile, and some would say pressing problems and challenges for space generally, and therefore for space law in particular, that exist at present are these two. Space has been used for military purposes since day one. The technology was driven by military concerns. I was in Montreal last week and <coughs> with a whole bunch of military people talking about, you know, we were all talking about the restrictions on military uses of space. But to talk about, you know, the restrictions, I was listening to a whole bunch of military people talking about the uses of outer space for military purposes, what they're doing. And it's just quite extraordinary. Space is quite clearly part of an in the integrated military platform of every country. No country, well, I mean, maybe some that don't have access, ready access, but no country would go to war without guaranteed access <coughs> to space technology. The Gulf War, the first Gulf War, was, is widely regarded as, quote unquote, the first space war, where space assets were used in a very significant way. You, and just one example. Think of these so-called smart bombs, and there are many other examples. But smart bombs, they're bombs that are directed by GPS satellites. But there's many other military uses of space. Coupled with that, although it's a different issue, one of the other major pressing problems is the notion of what we call space debris. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff up there that isn't functioning. It's guesstimated that there probably were, have been about, I don't know, three to 4,000 satellites sent into space since I was born. Currently functioning, maybe, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm guessing now, but let's say 1,000 a are functioning. I could be wrong, but it's you know, of that order. So you have, even if they were all intact, you still have <coughs> lots of other satellites that are not functioning. And most of them are the size of a combi van. So they're big things. But many of those have broken up. And so uh, the United States tracks space debris, but their technology, or our technology, is only sufficient to track pieces that are about 10 centimetres. We can't track anything that's smaller. So they're tracking, oh, the numbers vary, but it's about 30,000 pieces of debris. Debris are non-functioning. They just travel in these orbits. And they are travelling. 
if you don't already know, these things are travelling at you know, 15,000 kilometres an hour. They're seriously moving. So the kinetic energy of just even that, a bolt, would destroy anything else. And we've had a number of, they call them, you know, everything's euphemistic, right? We've had a number of so-called conjunctions where satellites have actually collided, of course, creating more debris. In 2007, the Chinese deliberately shot one of their satellites at an altitude, a really important altitude of about 800 kilometres, which is where lots of GPS satellites are, creating, it's guesstimated, another two or 3,000 pieces of debris. So some scientists say if we continue along the path we're moving, the Earth will look like Saturn in 100 years. And of course, these things are there to stay. You know, at high altitudes, they don't come down and burn up. And they become more and more dangerous. Space is a big place, but scientists guesstimate that if we continue along the same path, we won't be able to do the things and garner the benefits for all of humankind that we, you know, to the maximum that is appropriate. Because it becomes dangerous. And of course, remember, if we're continually trying to send more and more humans into space in whatever way, shape or form, then of course the risks are, are manifold there as well. So these are, and, and that, you know, we don't talk about space to bring out, you know, the UN term is long-term sustainability of space. It sort of makes sense. We've got no treaties. We deal with those by way of this, these soft law. Why? Because states are, it's impossible for states to agree. They won't agree on a de-weaponisation or trying to curtail military, military activities because the superpowers won't agree. You know, this issue has been shifted from the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and COPOS sits in, in uh, Vienna. So issues to do with military uses of space is typically not discussed there because the major States don't want to discuss there, and it's shifted to the Conference of Disarmament. Some of you will have heard of that, which sits in Geneva. Now, the Conference of Disarmament is the most dysfunctional UN agency in the world. They cannot even agree their agenda. Right? So there's not a lot of progress being made in terms of hard and fast rules to do with military uses. Likewise, we have some UN guidelines about debris but they're on a totally voluntary, non-binding basis. Because the costs are so astronomical, who wants to take responsibility? I mean, look at the schmozzle that has arisen out of the whole Kyoto Protocol regime, where in the end, the industrialized countries were accepted begrudgingly, when well, the United States didn't, <coughs> Australia only a lot later but accepted that they had that initial responsibility to deal with it. It hasn't happened in space. Too costly. And so we talk about mitigation, which is a common tool that we use terrestrially to try to deal with environmental issues. We never talk about cleaning up, remediation. We always talk about mitigation. Okay? Just remember what mitigation is. Mitigation is it's okay to pollute and continue to pollute, but just try to do it more slowly. Uh, which is, you know, I mean, uh, of course one can be cynical. Uh, I, the solutions about, you know, trying to grab pieces of debris, there are so many issues, not just technical. Technology is, in, the, in a sense, not even the issue. But there are so many other issues associated with that from a legal viewpoint, but we can come to that. So, we deal with this in this so-called soft law way. These are two really major problems. And I have some real issues with that. Because, you know, given our increasing reliance on soft law measures, non-binding measures, do we run the risk that they will work only until they don't? Shouldn't they be regarded only as interim measures until traditional international law binding ideas come into place? Typically what happens when you have, you know, after years and years and years and years and years of negotiation and discussion, you finally come up with something that has the word voluntary and non-binding, you know, throughout the document. Okay, it has value, I'm not saying it's worthless. But people then pat themselves on the back and move on to the next problem. And in the end, that becomes the end game. So, is it feasible to approach 
these really serious issues in that way. The politics of it means that, in a sense, we have no choice. But lots of people say, it'll never happen. We may as well not even try. And I'm not one of those people. OK. Small satellites, I've already talked about them a bit. I liken small satellites to the mobile telephones of space. You, know, you all know how mobile telephones have revolutionized communications on Earth in so many ways. And we're still, you know, my 15-year-old, just every time I say to her, Becky, please, well, you know, what do I do now? You know, she just can do amazing things with the phone, right? Our kids and their kids just, you know, their uses of their mobile phone, we don't even, we can't even imagine that. Well, small satellite technology, which revolutionizes the ability of non-spacefaring nations and entrepreneurs and universities, but also existing players to go to space in different ways for a lot less money, with a lot less lead time. You know, it breaks down a whole range of batteries. Sorry. Is that meaning that I have to shut up now? No, no. no. <laughs> um, uh, raise a whole range of regulatory issues, um, you can imagine. and and. For example, I, I take you back to the Australian legislation. Australian legislation put in place, nobody thought about small satellites. And now you've got entrepreneurs in Australia who think this is a way to make money, small satellites. Government, you've got to change your regulations because the regulatory framework you have is too onerous for us because we don't have as much money as Optus. I, a plug for Optus, my wife works for Optus. She's a satellite lawyer there, which Optus has satellites, right? And then, you know, Optus has money as well, right? So they can cope with the regulatory framework. But if you're an entrepreneur saying, I want to throw up a few small satellites, you know, they are going to government and going to other people and saying, hey, this, this is too onerous. Change the legislation. Make it easier for us. And that's where difficult policy decisions come into being. So there's all sorts of issues. But there are other questions. What's the impact of this technology on the space market? And what sort of frameworks are appropriate to, to make this balance between the interests of the state and entrepreneurs? And how will the existing space actors react to this? Some of you might have been aware of a phenomenon known as the Kodak moment, where Kodak, at one, at one time the leading photography camera company in the world, right? And as the digital technology for cameras came, they took, at a board level, a decision that, nah, nah, it's, it, we, we won't go there. And so who's heard of Kodak nowadays, right? Com yeah, so they talk about the Kodak phenomenon, the Kodak moment. So existing space players, you know, they might not like this technology, but they might have to deal with it. So what role does law have in facilitating commercial possibilities for entrepreneurs using low-cost satellites. We all say, well, of course that's what law should be, but it's not as straightforward as that because there are many risks associated with it from an environmental viewpoint, just to name one. Other issues. So, some of you will have heard of what I call the digitization of space. Some, of, some people have referred to it as a, as a GAFTA, G-A-F-T-A phenomenon. So GAFTA is Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Apple. Right? All of these companies recognise that for them to move to the next level of digital supremacy, they need to embrace within their technology space. So each of those companies I mentioned and others, Samsung, have announced in different ways very significant small satellite programs, you know, involving hundreds and indeed you know, tens, you know, tens of hundreds. <coughs> of small satellites to be launched to provide, for example, internet coverage around the world. They say there's about two thirds of the world that still doesn't have full-time <coughs> internet coverage. Of course, a lot of that is ocean, but anyway, they can use that as perhaps a platform for something else. Now, business cases have to be proven. There's a whole range of regulatory issues, but how will law deal with this? this convergence of cyberspace and space and how do we regulate this rush towards digitization how do we regulate human aerospace flight 
So I was recently, I talk about silos. Well, I was recently at a, at a, at a um, spoke at, a, at ICAO, like International Civil Aviation Organization, which is the supreme international body that deals with airplanes, commercial aviation. And they had a joint conference sponsored by themselves and the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, which is the Secretariat of the Space Committee. A joint on human aerospace. The first time, the first semblance of silos beginning to break. Because they both recognise this technology is moving. How the hell are we going to do it? Whose bailiwick is it? Who's going to take responsibility? What's the legal framework when you have technology that may use both space and outer space? Given that we at law still don't know where the demarcation is, but that's another question. But, but using those sorts of technologies. And indeed, there are proposals to redefine law in terms of zoning, as we have in, in the law of the sea, zoning the sea zoning airspace in different ways and outer space in different ways to deal with different types of technology. In the area of geopolitics, well I could go on and you know that's obviously of relevance to this institution a lot. I, I could come back and talk about, you know, there's so many issues here. But the the platform has changed a little bit. There are more and more emerging countries involved in space. The military regards space as this, and this is a term of art they use contested, congested, and competitive. That's how the military describes space. That's their mindset. Yeah. And with that mindset, you know, it's a race to the bottom, so to speak, in terms of arms races, in terms of a whole range of tensions. So how can the regulatory framework minimise those tensions, minimise the threat of conflict? What about Exploitation of natural resources. I mentioned that before, mining the moon and all of that. What a major challenge that will be. Again, I don't see that happening for many years, but it's really exciting. I was on Philip Adams' program last week on Radio National, and all they wanted to talk about was mining the moon. In May of this year, the United States Congress passed the Space Resources Exploration and Utilization Act. They're saying to their corporates, okay, you have the technology, we will guarantee you, and this law hasn't gone through Senate yet, but we will guarantee you property over what you mine. Now that doesn't sit very well with the international regime. But the United States is again trying to encourage industry development and the entrepreneurs. I'm not sure how that fits in. So there are lots of challenges for space. We find ourselves in interesting times. The existing framework, while important, and essentially, while successful, successful in the sense that we haven't had that conflict in space. We haven't had satellites deliberately taken out. Someone else, has, we've had lots of jamming issues, etc. But the fact that we haven't had it doesn't mean that it won't happen. And indeed, we are moving more towards that. If you listen to these military guys that I know and love and spoke to last week. And so we need to really sit back and think, you know, what do we want to do in space? How does it work? And that leads me to, and this is my last page, I know I'm running out of time. Probably the most important questions I can give you. How should, and I'll read these because I think they're important. How should the societal, community, and human aspects of our inexorable march into space be measured? Why has there been so little work done as regards the human rights aspects of the exploration and use of outer space? What legal and regulatory regimes best protect the broader interests of society without unduly restricting the development of appropriate space activities in the future? Do we want to have, you know, as much as there are increasing resources devoted to space, they are still limited and it's still expensive by and large. And so do we want to be having those resources devoted to military stuff? Okay, that's a difficult issue. Do we want them to be devoted to sex hotels? in space. As a ridiculous example, but lots of people think, well, this would be the greatest thing in the world. You know, we, we need to perhaps sit back. What is the criteria in which we are to determine the priorities that constitute appropriate future space activities? We should sit back, just have a cup of tea and think about it. And what role does law play? So in answering all these questions, it's important at all times, I believe, that we're conscious of and in here to the humanity that
that underpins the space law in order to avoid the possibility of scenarios that don't bear contemplation. In the end, this principle of humanity, it sounds utopian, but it's so important, must be the bedrock of all global legal regimes, including the regulation of use and exploration of outer space. So law has a crucial role to play in all of this, but lawyers certainly don't have the answers. We can't do it on our own. We don't have the tools to do so, nor the expertise. We need to bring all the stakeholders into the same room. We must exchange ideas, knowledge, expertise, all of those things. Understand how we can all work together to, to contribute to an appropriate future where space continues to play the important role that it has for the future of humankind. In the end, that is really the only way, getting back to the idea of entrepreneurship, that will only be the, the, the only way that some of the dreams of these entrepreneurs will be realised. But it's more important than that because it has broader ramifications. I'm sorry I've spoken for so long. I hope that's been interesting for you and thank you for your attention.